Hello everyone, my name is Eva Jaloul and I'm a PhD candidate in civil and environmental engineering at Florida State University. And on behalf of my research team, I'll be presenting our poster titled Lessons Learned from 2020-2021 Extreme Events, Recommendations for Sustainable Disaster Debris Management. Unfortunately, the number of natural or anthropogenic disaster events have been increasing significantly in recent years. An inevitable byproduct of such events is the debris generated. Along with its associated cost, improper, improper management of such debris can impede the timely recovery of the affected area, can easily overwhelm local waste management facilities, can have detrimental environmental impacts, and can negatively affect the mental well being of disaster impact communities. Taking these factors into consideration, management of disaster debris should be done in an effective and sustainable manner. In an effort to support such need, the Sustainable Material Management Extreme Events Reconnaissance, or SAMIR for short, was established in 2020 with funding from the National Science Foundation. The mission of SAMIR is to advance the state of the art and the state of practice in sustainable management of post-disaster materials through reconnaissance activities and the training of interdisciplinary researchers. As part of its reconnaissance activities, Samir has been responding to some of the federally declared disaster events occurring since its, since its establishment in 2020. Conducted investigations were disseminated in the form of virtual assessment reports, which entailed collecting multifaceted data used to investigate the feasibility of and identify the presence of any documented application of sustainable debris management practices. Based on the findings of, the, of these virtual assessment reports, in this poster, we identify the enablers and disruptors to sustainable debris management practices for each of the investigated four disaster events. Such identification is conducted in accordance with the main aspects impacting the effective implementation of disaster debris recycling and reuse, ranging from relevant policy and pre-disaster planning measures, material conditions, available logistics and infrastructure capabilities, governmental and community support for recycling, and finally, the availability of disaster debris data. As I mentioned, four disaster events are covered in this investigation, namely the Michigan Midland flooding, which was a 500 year flood hitting central Michigan in May 2020 and generating mm -hmm. huge amounts of building debris. The seven tornadoes hitting Middle Tennessee in March 2020 with the strongest two being EF3 and EF4, resulting in considerable amounts of building debris. Third, Hurricane Laura, which is a category four hurricane, severely impacting Louisiana, generating colossal amounts of vegetative and building debris. And lastly, the, tra the, tra the tragic building collapse that took place in June 2021 in Surfside, Florida, resulting in intricate piles of building debris. Despite the benefits of debris recycling and reuse, their actual practical implementation remains limited in recent disaster events, with the predominant reliance on local landfills as the main debris management pathway. This has been the case in the four investigated disaster events, except for the Florida Surfside building collapse, whose generated debris was considered as evidentiary materials, complicating its management until, until investigations and ongoing litigations are resolved. The identified enablers for sustainable debris management in the case of Michigan Midland flooding include having a formalized pre-disaster debris planning process, which included the identification of the debris management program, the establishment and training of a debris management team, equipping a debris management center, and reviewing the debris management plan. Second, the development of a state sample debris management plan to guide the development of localized plans, Finally, the good performance of some counties and communicating to the public information and guidelines about the debris management process. Meanwhile, the disruptors include the absence of county-specific debris management plans, the lack or little incentive for state and local jurisdictions to promote recycling or the use of debris, the potential debris, chemical, biological, and pathogenic contamination from polluted floodwaters, household hazardous waste, and wastewater treatment plants, the limited public awareness about target recycling or reuse goals, guidelines for curbside debris segregation, and potential hazards associated with the debris, the establishment and use of only one TDMS, potentially due to strict environmental guidelines set forth in the state debris management plan, the 
heavy reliance on municipal solid waste landfills for managing the disaster debris due to their high available capacity and close proximity. And finally, the lack or limited disaster debris data. As for the March 2020 Tennessee tornadoes, the enablers for sustainable, the identified enablers for sustainable disaster debris management included the, the presence of a state sample debris management plan to guide the development of localized plans, the support of curbside on site segregation of debris and, guide and guidance of community members on proper debris separation. Meanwhile, the disruptors included Again, the absence of county-specific debris management plans, the absence of pre-identified and pre-approved temporary debris management sites, the limited availability of material recovery facilities with the majority of the identified facilities being only for metal recycling or recovery, and the lack or limited disaster debris data. In the case of Hurricane Laura, the enablers for sustainable disaster debris management included the promotion of debris recycling as it is listed among the recommended methods for reduction of the debris stream in Louisiana's comprehensive plan for disaster cleanup and debris management, the provision of guidance on how to process and manage major debris streams, the pre-disaster identification of locations suitable for serving as temporary debris management sites, along with the pre-approving them for staging specific debris streams, the support of curbside on-site segregation and the guidance of community members on proper debris separation, and the efficient and clear communication of the status of the debris operations with the public through an interactive dashboard. Meanwhile, the disruptors included the absence of fetish-specific debris management plans, the absence of recycling or reuse guidelines for major debris streams that are potentially recyclable, such as construction and demolition debris and wood waste, the lack of formalized allocation of debris management roles and responsibilities among relevant stakeholders in the debris management plan, the potential debris contamination due to the presence of plant pests in Louisiana in addition to the reported oil and chemical spills caused by Hurricane Laura, the unavailability of material recovery facilities in seven of the most affected parishes in Louisiana. Further, out of the identified material recovery facilities, only one was determined to accept and recycle mm -hmm. construction and demolition debris, which was a major debris stream generated by Hurricane Laura. Additionally, the relatively low waste recycling rates during peacetime indicating weak support for recycling both from the government and from the community. And lastly, the lack or limited disaster debris data. For the Florida surfside building collapse, the identified enablers for sustainable disaster debris management included the presence of well-established state and regional pre-disaster preparedness plans and post-disaster protocols due to the high susceptibility of Florida to disaster events, the formalized allocation of roles and responsibilities among entities involved in the debris management process, the enhanced preparedness through annual disaster debris preparation meetings, the increased chances to receive federal cost reimbursement through debris contracting and monitoring trainings, and the presence of a standardized framework for the debris removal operations with clearly explained phases. As for the disruptors, they include the limited recycling or reuse guidelines for different types of potentially recyclable materials in different debris streams, the absence of pre-identified and pre-approved temporary debris management sites, the limited field debris estimation frameworks and reconnaissance resources, and finally, the association of the debris with investigations and litigation, further complicating its management and contributing to limited available debris data. Based on the findings presented in this poster, a number of recommendations can be made to promote future sustainable debris management practices. Starting with the pre-disaster planning measures, localized debris management plans that are tailored to the characteristics and available resources of each locality must be established and maintained. To achieve that, good communication between state and local jurisdictions is key to hold the latter accountable for creating and updating such plans. Also as part of pre-disaster planning, suitable locations for temporary debris management sites must be identified and pre-approved to facilitate the storing, staging, and processing of post-disaster materials for recycling and reuse. 
Along the same lines, local jurisdictions should support the establishment of these sites to avoid direct transport of debris materials to local landfills following a disaster event. As for the debris management infrastructure, investments must be made to establish and maintain material recovery facilities with enough capacities to meet the anticipated amounts of potentially recyclable debris streams. Once a disaster actually hits, reconnaissance missions must be conducted to collect a range of multifaceted data from the disaster affected region during the response, short-term recovery, and long-term recovery phases. With regards to policy measures, a feasible rate of debris recycling or reuse should be defined by state and local mm -hmm. jurisdictions specifically for that disaster event to serve as the basis of a regulatory incentive program to promote sustainable mm -hmm. debris management practices. Mm -hmm. In terms of community engagement, media outlets should be utilized to highlight the target recycling or reuse goals and provide the public with the guidelines on curbside debris segregation and self-hauling. Lastly, in terms of future work and research needs, research efforts must be made for the development of accurate and standardized frameworks for estimating degree quantity, composition, and degree of contamination to facilitate disaster reconnaissance using state-of-the-art instrumentation and mobile data collection applications. I would like to end this poster presentation by inviting you all to join our growing interdisciplinary summary network by scanning this QR code or by visiting samir.org slash membership to take part in Samir's mission and remain up to date with Samir's news and activities. Thank you for listening and please reach out if you have any questions.